We begin with Facebook's decision to uphold that ban on former President Trump, at least for now. Uh, we're also going to talk about the future of the Republican Party. President Biden actually spoke about that just a few minutes ago. Take a listen. It seems as though the Republican Party is trying to identify what it stands for. And they're in the midst of a significant uh, sort of mini revolution going on in the Republican Party. Um, I've been a Democrat for a long time. We've gone through periods where we've had internal fights and disagreements. I don't ever remember any like this. And so, as one of you said, and I'm not embarrassed by identifying them, as one of you said on national television last night, we badly need a Republican Party. We need a two-party system. It's not healthy to have a one-party system. And I think the Republicans are further away from trying to figure out who they are and what they stand for than I thought they would be at this point. So for more on this, let's bring in Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl and our political director, Rick Klein. John, I'll start with you. First, just quick reaction. What do you make of President Biden's comments on this? And what's your take on the state of the Republican Party right now? Uh, well, he's right. There is a battle right now underway for the heart and soul of the Republican Party. It's a battle uh, that pits traditional conservatives uh, against those that believe that Donald Trump is either the leader of the party or somebody that the party needs uh, uh, to succeed. And right now, uh, the, the, the Trump line of the party is clearly dominant. Um, I think we're going to see a vote next week where Liz Cheney, the number three Republican uh, in the House, and somebody who is under any measure a conservative Republican uh, thrown out of leadership. Well, Rick, I want to pick up on, on what John says and, and contest it a little bit, uh, which is, although, John, you, you, you mentioned that Trumpism is dominant in the Republican Party. Biden's talking, they're like they're having some kind of civil war. I can't imagine a, a, a state or even a district where a non-Trumpist candidate would win. Uh, this, is a, this is really Trump's party. The problem may be that, the, that they don't accept Biden's election, may not accept the, the next one. But how do you read where, where the Trump uh, movement is inside the Republican Party. Well, if there is a civil war, then, then you know, right now Donald Trump is continuing to win round after round, and it may actually be over. I think there's a school of thought that says uh, uh, Trump won the, the, the argument about what the soul of the party should look like, uh, and it's Trumpist. Uh, and the fact that this is happening now at the same time that he loses access uh, on a semi-permanent basis, at least to his Facebook account, speaks to the enduring appeal of Trumpism. And people after January 6th thought, well, maybe it's time for the party to divorce uh, itself from Donald Trump. Or maybe there's some kind of a detente between uh, President Trump and the MAGA forces and the anti-Trump forces who think that he shouldn't have a role in the party's future. Clearly, there isn't space right now in any mainstream, even Republican circles, for any of the traditional conservative uh, school of thought that John is referencing. Trumpism is winning if it hasn't already outright won the, the battle for what the definition of the Republican Party is. And, Rick, you mentioned the Facebook decision, so I want to go back to that for a second. You know, the, the decision today wasn't really a decision. It just kept the suspension going for now and kind of kicked it back to Facebook, the platform itself, to decide whether Trump will be banned for good or not. So what does this do in the meantime, while he is suspended, uh, for his possibilities of making a comeback, considering how big social media was in his initial rise to power? I think it's fair to say that he wouldn't be president without Facebook and, and the way that it was used in ways that were uh, both subtle and overt as a fundraising and organizing tool, also as just a, a means of communication with his followers. Uh, Donald Trump desperately needs Facebook or something like it uh, if he's going to mount a political comeback. Now he's got other avenues, he has other ways to get his, his message out, and clearly the Trump message uh, has, has permeated through the Republican Party even in the absence of his access to Twitter and Facebook. But this is a blow to Donald Trump. Uh, make no mistake. Uh, he and his team wanted Facebook. They'd like to have access to Facebook. Uh, there may still be a path back, but uh, given the way that, they, that even the president, the former president, has handled this news, it, it doesn't look like it's going. He's going to make it a particularly easy path. He is still purveying many of the, the mistruths, the outright lies that uh, that led to his ban in the first place. 
And that will create, his ban will create issues for Facebook. But let me go back to Trump and John Carl on this. So he's, uh, Donald Trump now created his own feed on his own website. He's releasing statements. I mean, it's not like he can't speak and nobody hears him. There's multi-billion dollar media companies that, that do very little else than advance his goals and report every word he says. Nevertheless, you know, how does, what does his course ahead look like uh, given this current ban and what his plans are? Well, I've talked to his, uh, his current uh, cadre of political advisors about this, and they say that they are actively exploring uh, alternative social media platforms, suggesting uh, perhaps it could even be a, a company uh, that is, you know, if not created by Trump himself, created by Trump supporters, uh, that would provide another social media platform. But that is a, that is a tough road. That said, Terry, uh, you, you know, you, you point out a, a truth, which is Donald Trump is back in many ways. His message is out there. Just look at the way uh, the Republican Party is responding to him. Uh, his, you know, there, some people were kind of making fun of this notion that he's got this uh, this new feed on on his um, on his website. It looks a little bit like a blog, something that Terry Moran probably had 15 years ago. Um, but it's uh, you know it's 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 a it's a blog where he puts all his statements and with a simple click, uh, a a supporter can link uh, to that statement and. Posted on their own social media accounts. So the word is getting out. And Donald Trump is clearly sending a signal, my sense is, really over the past several weeks, uh, that he is eager uh, to get his voice out there. He's eager above above all, uh, to get revenge against those Republicans who uh, he believes betrayed him uh, in, in the final weeks of his presidency. And, and John, it hasn't, uh, you know, he's been without this digital megaphone for about four months already. And as you say, so far, yeah. he still holds great power over the party. But it has raised a lot of outrage over the issue in general. His supporters say he's being censored, and not just him, but other conservatives as well. And now you, we're looking at people on both sides, supporters and critics of the president, saying that maybe the government should get involved here. So do you think that this could backfire on the big tech companies? Uh, I think that this is uncharted territory and some really big fundamental issues about our democracy and about what free speech, what the First Amendment means in the digital age. Uh, you know, on one hand, Facebook is is a private company. Twitter is a private company. Uh, they, you know, under any traditional measure, would be able to determine who could or could not use their platform. Uh, but when they become so important, such an important way for particularly political figures to get a message message out, is it okay for a company, a corporation, to decide which political figures can have access uh, to a platform uh, that is in, in, the, the, the primary way that many Americans get their information? I mean, this is potentially putting these companies uh, in a position of helping to determine who wins a presidential election. I mean, we're, we're still uh, three years away, uh, you know, from 2024, but if Donald Trump, for instance, uh, were, were to run for office? again. I mean, is it really okay uh, for, for uh, social media companies to, to decide that that candidate's not going to get access to this very important tool, but the other candidates are? And what would happen? I mean, this is Donald Trump. It's, it's easy to maybe make a case for some against putting him out there. What, what, what if the argument were, or what, what, what if the same tactics were used against uh, uh, Bernie Sanders or against uh, somebody on the left? Um, you know, the, the, these are tough, these are thorny issues, and I'm not sure the government comes coming in to regulate who does or does not get a chance uh, to get a voice out is actually consistent with the original intent of the First Amendment either. But, you know, the whole reason why we're having this conversation is because there has been a lot of very dangerous misinformation that has been spread on these platforms. We saw the impact of that on January 6th. And it's a question of what do you do to combat that misinformation? And there were supposed to be platforms that brought us together and enlightened us with all the information available yeah. to us. Those are the old days when we thought of that. Now, Rick, you've read through Facebook's Oversight Board's opinion, uh, and it does tell us not just about Facebook, but a little bit about Trump on the way he tried to get back on the platform. 
Fascinating. One of the arguments that his backers made to Facebook and this oversight board uh, was that the Trump backers, the true Trump backers, were not involved in the riots on January 6th, and that the, the, their argument is that outside agitators were more than likely involved in organizing that. Of course, those statements fly in the face of the facts that we witnessed with our own eyes on January 6th. Clearly, Trump supporters were there. Clearly, this was not the actions of outside agitators. Uh, but yeah, adding new mistruths, new lies to the, to the pile even in trying to make the argument that he deserves to get back on. All right. Well, Jonathan Carl, Rick Klein, thanks very much on this eventful day in the Trump world. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.